International FPNA Board and FPNA Trends Ambassador, and today I'll facilitate this meeting for you. Uh, today we are joined by almost 400 people from 32 countries, 71% is from UK and Ireland. And we have a great panel of four members today with great insight to share with yourself. So looking forward to that. Let me take you through what the agenda looks like for today. So first of all, we'll look at driver-based forecasting to scenario planning. And this is a case study from Medtronic. Uh, our second uh, speaker will talk to us about FPNA teams and skills required in this uncertain environment how to start your predictive analytics journey. So predictive analytics is big on the agenda. How do you start that journey? And finally, we will conclude with the role of technology for scenario planning and predictive planning. We will then have quick conclusion and recommendation, and then we will finish off with the Q&A session. Uh, just uh, for you guys to read at leisure, these are the discussion subjects we've had in uh, the geography, so in the UK. It is now a great time for me to introduce our speakers for today. So speakers, uh, panelists, if you would like to join me on the webcam and uh, go off mute as well, and I'll start the introduction. Um, our first speaker for today is Nawal Roses Delpit, who is Finance Director, Head of FPNA EMEA at Medtronic. Um, Nawal has been leading the FPNA team at Medtronic EMEA for the last five years, very much into financial planning, risks, opportunities uh, for the EMEA leadership team. Uh, Nawal is very passionate about supporting growth initiatives and he specializes in using scenario planning analytics, as you would see in his presentation, to support the leaders and drive performance. Now, great to have you with us today. Thanks, Hans. Pleased to meet you all and uh, I'm very excited to be here today and uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, now, is going to tell us about his case study and of course uh, he also joins us from Paris. So great to have you with us now. Let's now move on quickly to Abby. Our second speaker uh, will be Abby Obomiki, who is Group FPNA Director at Spectris. Uh, Abby is a qualified accountant with over 15 years of experience, but much more importantly within the FPNA arena, which is what she's doing at Spectris. She is also heavily involved in project management and hence on experience in delivering and managing finance transformational uh, project. Abby is very passionate in talent development, finance automation, business partnering and also acting as a role model for BAME within the FPNA talents. Today, Abby will talk to us about FPNA teams and skills required in uncertain environments. Abby, great to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to the discussions. Thank you. Abby joins us from London. Um, our third speaker for today will be Tanbia Jasmudin, who is Finance Director at Vardax. Uh, finance analytic transformation expert within, with experience gained in several environment, several multinational uh, and management consultancies. Uh, currently at Vardex, as you've seen, uh, a law firm specializing in family law for high net worth individuals. Uh, Tanbia is passionate about encouraging CFOs and the wider finance community to develop into digital natives. Tanbia will today tell us about how you start your predictive analytics journey. Tanbia, great to have you with us today. Thanks, Hans. Looking forward to this. And Tanbia joins us from Essex near London. Finally, we've got uh, Alex, uh, Alexander Her Hermes, or Alex, who is principal consultant at CCH Togetic. Um, Alex of course, guides customers through their finance transformation and helps leverage the full capabilities of uh, CCH Togetics platform. He's worked in Germany as solution architect, has designed and implement, implemented numerous FPNA solutions. He's also passionate about technology, deep understanding of business processes, and is keen to identify approaches to work with CFO and bring changes. Uh, Alex will talk to us about role of technology for scenario planning and predictive planning today. 
Uh, Alex joins us from London as well. Alex, great to have you with us. Yeah, pleasure to be joining. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much, panelists. We've got a, a, a great full panelists today and we've got fantastic insight for you guys. So uh, please hang tight. Guys, if you could turn your webcam off, we've got a few more pages to go before uh, we start our presentation. Uh, projects and initiatives of FPNA Trends Group. As you know, we are now in 27 cities, 16 countries and four continents, and that is only going to grow going forward. Today, we're bringing together London or UK and Ireland. Um, also worth highlighting that we have implemented best practice workshop and FPNA consult consultancy uh, due to high demand from our FPNA board members itself. Uh, what is the digital FPNA board? 90 minutes webinar. We have four polling questions for you guys to participate in. Please do vote. We've got an interactive Q&A session. You can ask your question via the chat box. You can start now if you have any questions or wait till the presenters have started presenting. Make sure you're directed to who you want uh, us to ask the question. You can network with us directly via LinkedIn. The presentation is available in handout to download. Uh, you will also receive a recording and a copy of the presentation within two days after the meeting. Uh, and finally, at the end of the meeting, when I close it, there is a feedback session. So please stay and give us a quick feedback on uh, how we did, but also on discussion subjects you would like to hear about in future. A quick thank you to our technology sponsor there, CCH Tagetic, a world to clues company. Of course, we all know them, corporate performance management solution provider and also finance transformation platform provider. So thank you very much, uh, uh, CCH to get you. Um, I've got a couple of slides before we start our presentation. So evolution of planning from traditional to predictive. We all know this model. We've seen it so many times, traditional planning model. It doesn't work anymore outside of that predictive um, span. You know, it doesn't work anymore. With uncertain environment, it doesn't work anymore. So what's the next step from that? Next step from that is, of course, the inclusion of driver base model, which is where we find out what are the key drivers using Pareto principle, 20% of the drivers, you know, uh, telling us about 80% of the result. And what we're seeing now is the predictive planning model where, where um, on top of drive base, we've got uh, drivers that are generated by a machine. We're using statistical trends, machine learning algorithm to be able to tell us what the end result will be. The predictive planning maturity model. Uh, you guys must have seen that before. If, if you haven't, this has been developed by the FPNA board over the last few years. Um, I don't have a lot of time to go through it, but it's just worth highlighting the leading stage there where you find companies trying to aim for the full integration. You know, drivers there are user and machine learning defined, which we will see in uh, our presentation uh, later on. The values are linked to the detail plan, so PNL, balance sheet, cash flow, operational plans, as well as financial plan. And finally, uh, user and machine defined uh, drivers. Yeah, we will see that in, in a bit as well. Uh, just with, before we move on, just for clarity's sake, this is a, uh, a something that uh, the AI and machine learning committee uh, has come up with, just to make sure that people aren't confused with all these different terms. Data science encompasses the whole of this, which is artificial intelligence, machine learning, as well as deep learning have a quick read at that uh, of that at your own leisure and finally there just to highlight predictive uh, analytics is the use of data statistical algorithm and machine learning techniques to identify the likelihood of future outcome based on historical data and today we'll see how we use the predictive analytics you know for the purposes of planning for the future moving on so today we'll talk about scenario planning, a case study, team skills, predictive analytics and technology. And our first 
presentation will be from Nawal Rosa Stelpi, who is Finance Director, Head of FPNA EMEA at Medtronic. And um, Nawal will take us through his case study within his organization. Nawal, over to you whenever you're ready. Thank you, Hans. And uh, again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. So we can move to the next slide. So in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they are not. I picked this quote from uh, Dr. Albert Einstein about the, the difference between theory and practice because I think it summarizes quite well the challenge, um, the challenge we are facing when we are forecasting nowadays. As you mentioned, traditionally, we could rely on the theory. A forecast consisted in a, in a set of assumptions that we were documenting, that's theory. And we were working with it a full year to drive execution, that's the, that's the practice part. So that model does not really work in volatile and uncertain uh, environment. Um, we all see it, our plans need to be constantly changed. The pandemic is obviously an extreme example. Uh, we faced uh, other uh, natural disasters before that. We face political, economic instability in many areas. Fortunately, there is also positive change. Uh, there are breakthrough technologies, um, acceleration of uh, remote working solutions. Uh, in the medical industry, um, if I think about this last year, um, the remote treatment of patients has certainly accelerated like uh, never before. So today, I'm going to share a bit of the journey that we have done at Medtronic in EMEA to upgrade our forecasting processes and tend to scenario planning. So at Medtronic, we actually started this journey back in 2017, so four years ago. At that point in time, our challenge was not so much volatility, but rather dealing with inefficiencies. Uh, we got an internal survey that showed that FPA teams were spending more than 40% of their time forecasting and less than 15% doing business partnering support. We also got uh, the feedback from the business partners that they could not even see what, the va what was the value of all this uh, time spent forecasting. So back then we spent a good six months working on a roadmap to address this problem, how to extract much more value from forecasting activities while spending less time on it. Out of this, we took two main decisions. Uh, the first one, was to create value by moving to a driver-based uh, forecasting approach. So what it meant exactly is not just collecting and consolidating numbers anymore, but modeling gross initiatives, modeling resource allocations, collecting decisions points um, about those levers. The second decision, was to gain efficiency by doing a strong effort in terms of uh, centralization and standardization. So establishing what we called centers of expertise, COEs, as owners of the full ecosystem that you have here um, in this slide in the graph. So looking at this graph, the outcome of the ecosystem is the darker part. So you see the reporting more and more digitalized, uh, smooth, fast forecasting processes, more and more moving to uh, scenario planning. So that's what an internal customer wants to see. The, I would say the emerged part of the iceberg. In this case, uh, internal customers, of course, are fp &E teams, but it can also be uh, business partners um, themselves. So what this graph is showing as well is that to get to this part, the emerged part of the iceberg, uh, we needed to implement a, a robust infrastructure in the background. And this took a lot of discipline, um, first in the way we organized and maintained the data, in the, in the way we had to rebuild all the processes 
And then in the way we were consolidating these, driver, uh, these drivers, and, um, all the insights that then could lead to uh, actionable uh, analytics. So looking at where we are today, uh, we've done a massive progress on an uh, expenses forecast. Uh, today it's uh, fully driver-based. The process can be run in a couple of days uh, when it used to be weeks. Um, functional expenses, um, I think we moved from more than 40 people touching the forecast uh, to now uh, five. And if I think about a specific scenario planning, um, when it comes to expenses, travel expenses. In the past, each FPNA person would evaluate and forecast the travel expenses uh, for their area. Today, we work with standards by job code, by geography, uh, a business leader in Germany, for instance, we know it will spend in average this much in travel each year, while a sales rep in UK will spend this much. So this is a predefined driver. And now, as we get out of the pandemic, the question is, are we going to travel as much as before COVID? How much time it will take to go back there? So these are scenarios, and we can run them at employee level in a couple of minutes. 30% uh, of pre-COVID levels, 40%, 50%. So that's uh, what this infrastructure enabled. We did something similar with revenues. Uh, the key scenario there for us related to hospital capacity. How fast are hospitals going to treat 100% of patients again? and not just uh, COVID patients? Is there a plateau before that? Um, does it differ by kind of therapy? So we did our modeling on this as, the, as well. Uh, was it perfect? Uh, certainly not. But we started seeing the value of creating uh, these simple scenarios. And uh, definitely, um, we want to accelerate. Next slide, please. So if I reflect on the lessons learned, uh, from my perspective, it's important to appreciate this is a long transformation. You do that over years. Um, it's not just a transformation of your forecasting processes or uh, analytical insights. It's about changing the role of the, of the FP&A teams. Um, those teams need to move from producing financial information to interpret it and to influence decisions. So I would say it's one thing to be able to technically create these scenarios, but it's another thing to pick the relevant scenarios that will help strategic uh, decisions. So change management is, uh, is super important and we need to, to realize that it's a big change for an FPNA person. Uh, they used to have all the details in uh, spreadsheets uh, and suddenly you need to rely on, uh, on the work that someone else is, uh, is doing. So you need to provide simple analytics first, show that it works, and then uh, only uh, move to more complex modeling. And business leaders need to change as well. They need to, uh, to see the value that you're bringing. And last, if you're really serious about this, you need to have all the infrastructure integrated. Uh, you can always do, of course, some uh, level of scenario modeling offline. But if you really want scalability, there is no chance you need to, uh, to go for an end-to-end -end process and end-to-end uh, -end systems. This way, you will be able to see the impact of strategic decisions down to product codes or, uh, or individual resources. Next slide, please. So as a conclusion, I think, um, if uh, you want to see how to go further, the ambition to me could be to have all those uh, capabilities at, at fingertip, uh, to have the ability to build very simple scenarios, but relying on very rich and detailed uh, set of information. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, this will help for sure. Um, and the, the roles will move to be much more strategic partners. Um, it will require further focus on how we use the data, uh, further focus on uh, visualization, further focus on uh, communication. 
So that uh, I think brought me to the to the end of my presentation today. I hope you could uh, relate to it, and uh, hence I uh, give it back to you. Thank you, Nawal. I think you started with some great stats there in that 40% of the time was spent in forecasting and only 15% was value adding. So, uh, and I think this is what we generally see. And thank you for taking us through a fantastic presentation in terms of how you turn this around. Can I ask our fellow uh, panelists to come and join us and, and now uh, give us some insight uh, into what um, Nawal has, has spoken about? Uh, Abby, if I may start with yourself, please. Hi, um, I know I think that was a great presentation just to learn about your journey. I think that, like, it really fits into my own presentation when we talk about it's a journey and giving the FPA, redefining the FPA mandate. At the end of the day, I think what COP came across mm -hmm. out is it's not just about the FPA output, it's actually adding value to the business and to the FPA team. So, great, great, great learning from you. Uh, Tanvia, your comments, please. Yeah, I think, I think that one of the things that um, strike me is um, this concept around delivery through Agile. Um, you know, you do a little bit at a time, see the benefit, users get to play with it, feedback. Um, I think ultimately you end up with a much better product and much faster. Um, this compares with the traditional method of um, you hand over some stuff to the developers, they come back 18 months later and it's not quite what they asked for. Thank you. Uh, Alex? Yeah, I also found uh, this presentation really interesting and also the approach of really identifying the pain points to then come to some um, real efficiency gains by, by addressing these in a very ordered manner. And here again, also from my point of view, taking these incremental steps of, of making sure that you've got something fast and to validate that and then move on in an orderly fashion. So yeah, that was really interesting. Thank you very much for your comments, uh, panelists, and, and now I'll thank you for a, a fantastic presentation and taking us through your journey in Medtronic. Uh, guys, if we now uh, move on and ask uh, our um, attendees today as to how they're dealing with um, scenario planning within their own company via this polling question, um, if you can vote, please. So I'll just read this out for you guys. Uh, how would you describe your current FPA scenario planning processes? Non-existent, very traditional. So worst best case scenario, uh, our scenarios are time consuming and not multi-dimensional. And finally, our scenario planning are real time and multi-dimensional. Uh, if you can vote, please. So first option, non-existent. Second option, very traditional. Third option, um, time consuming and not multi-dimensional. Uh, and finally, scenario planning is run in real time. 75% uh, have already voted, so I'm going to close it and I'm going to share the result with our panelists. So 11% says non-existent, very surprisingly. 50% very traditional, 27% time consuming and not multidimensional, and 11% uh, planning is real time and multidimensional. Uh, Nawal and Abby, if I can get some comments from you, starting with Nawal, please. Yes, um, from my perspective, that uh, that was somewhat expected. I mean, uh, we we still have a, a few non-existent. More most are uh, on this early stage. Yet, as I tried to explain, it's a long journey. So uh, I think the importance is to get started, especially after uh, the period we just went through. And, um, and it's nice to see that uh, actually in total 90% are already uh, on their way. Thank you. Uh, Abby, your comment, please. Yeah, it's good to see that people are on that journey. Um, and then if you know where you are, you can actually take those steps. So um, traditional shows that there is some elements and some appetite for scenario planning. And then great to see that 11% are early adopters and have started their journey. So wherever you are on the journey, it's good. I'll just encourage the non-existence to actually start thinking about it and reducing that 11% when you leave this um, call and, and have you think about what they can do differently. Yeah, they're absolutely spot on. I think uh, we, we need to uh, make sure that the 11% non-existent kind of move to the next stage. And of course, for everybody else to move to the next stage. And with the help of platforms and things like that, I think we can do a lot more than that. So thank you very much for uh, your inside panelists. 
and let us now move on to our next session, which is around FDNA teams and skills required. And to deliver that, we've got Abby Obamigi, who's Group FDNA Director at Spectris. Um, Abby, over to you whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Hi, I'll start with this quote which says, if you want to go fast, go alone, and if you want to go far, go together. And I think in FPNA and in your journey, just listening to and know about redefining the mandate of an FPNA team, you need both at different times. Uh, I, I think vision is quite important and that gives you your mandate. And in FPNA, we talk about our different um, strategies. We are, we are in the know for the long term, fast term, short term, rolling forecast. So what is your vision and how do you align it to the company's vision to serve a couple? So make a vision and make it plain so that your team can run with it. Once again, it is a journey. Um, the same thing when you're implementing anything, there is change and change management. Building the team, having the team cohesion, having the team um, working together at different stages require you taking a step back and looking at the different skills at the different time. Change management is also part of the team building process. I'm sure many of you have changed jobs like I have done or people within your team have moved on. What have you done with that change? For me, it's the time to look at my skill set within the team and actually see where it is lacking and where we need support because we've come through a different journey. And then how agile is your team? How do you look at the team to encourage going together and to encourage going far? Um, as a manager, you can't do it alone. Um, you need your team to go out into the various business um, to be business partners. So you need the environment to go fast and then come back and go together, bringing in the news and bringing in those two sets that you need. And my next slide um, shows the different things that you need as an FP and A team to be ready. What, what are the things? I've kind of put it into two buckets, but I'm sure they cut across um, our various elements. We have the traditional technical skills, which where we kind of are, are good at. Um, the technical skills, and what does technical mean today? It means many things for different people. How do you ensure that as a team, you have the right technical skills to fit your various um, journey and various change to be able to support the business? Uh, we talk about the various data analytics. Data analytics is a big word and the buzzword for FPNA teams today. How do you make sure you have that? But more interestingly, I think it's the human skills that is, is key for me. How do you build collaboration and communication? And how do you encourage growth mindset within your team? Because that's where you can actually extend the technicalities that you have within the team and also promote the business in terms of partnering and giving the business what you need. And in today's world, especially in my, in my experience, COVID has taught us to think outside the box. A few months ago, nobody would have thought of working in a team where you don't see the people. Uh, I recently joined an organization in the middle of COVID, and today was the first day I actually met a team that I recruited because we've not seen ourselves for over a year. How have we developed time on time again? So relationship building, influencing is also quite important. Really, a combination of these skills and the right experience makes FPNL agile. When we talk about agile, we always look at tools, but I think also it is important. Next slide, please. So after you've built a, a, a good team, why do you need this team to work? We're talking about the efficiencies. Um, the team will affect your four Ps in terms of people, um, in terms of processes and in terms of the product, but also the platform. You can have a good product and not use it properly. Uh, I came into one of my organizations in the past and the way the tool was being used, even not because I'd seen it used somewhere else, they were ready to bin it and, 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 and get a new tool. So sometimes it's not the tool itself. It's how do you use that tool to add value? And adding value, like Neil said, is quite important to ensure that you get the right insight and the right movement as you move along. Finance transformation is another buzzword that we keep hearing, but what does it mean to your teams? Because in FPNA, your team is quite pivotal in finance transformation and even in business transformation in terms of a company-wide change. So it's not all about what we want to do, it's how do we make sure that the business have a business because without the business, there are no fancy KPIs, there are no reporting, 
There is no scenario planning if you don't have the right people to take that tool and extend it. So recruit right, develop your team, and make sure you lead it to the next slide, please. So how do you invest in your team? We are always busy, but how productive is your team? And I keep and I like to talk about the three arrows: repeat, review, and, ref, uh, and refresh. How do you do that? Take some time. You might have the opportunity to start on a new basis and increase your team bandwidth by investing in people because they are your main assets. How do you find time to train and develop? Um, I try to schedule one-to-one -one meetings, and in that one-to-one -one meetings, I ask them to go for a podcast instead of speaking to me all the time and learn something. So still those little times, but encourage them. But I also, I remember that it's your career. I can take the horse to the water, but I can't force you to drink water. So start something you yourself can improve and have an environment for coaching and mentoring. Um, two years ago, I started reverse coaching where the younger people in my team were telling us about technology, how to use it, bringing out videos instead of writing manuals to actually help our processes. And those are things that you can do. And I'll end up saying that if you think you're too small to make a difference, then you haven't spent a night with a mosquito. Um, so, and start today, that's all I can say. Start today, invest in time and make sure you train. It's a journey. Um, over to you, thanks. Abby, thank you very much. I, I love the three R's, which is repeat, review, and refresh. Um, and thank you for taking us through the skill set required um, in these uncertain environments, how you bring together the team, how you keep the team together, motivated, and moving forward in this uncertain environment. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to invite our fellow panelists to come and join us uh, and give us some insight. Uh, and I will start with Nawal. Nawal. Yes. Uh, thank you, Abby. I found your uh, presentation super relevant, and uh, I can very much relate to to the need for FPNA teams to adapt and develop new skills. Of course. Uh, in parallel, I think I, I'd like to also stress that it's important to clarify roles and responsibilities, um, roles and responsibilities of the FPNA teams but also of all the teams around FPNA, uh, controlling finance services, commercial excellence, business intelligence, and many more. Uh, these, teams are also, the, these teams are also transforming, um, and we need to make sure we understand each other's roles, each other's um, responsibilities to make sure that uh, we don't duplicate efforts and, uh, and, and that we can have a strong collaboration. Very interesting point, Nawal. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Tanbir? Oh, yes, um, I, I love the problems, by the way. They're brilliant. Um, one thing I will say, I'll, I'll reiterate the fact that you do need to spend the time um, creating space to invest in your learning and development to create the right culture. Um, you talked about going together or going further. Um, if you're not learning and developing, you're not moving at all. Thank you, Tanbir. Uh, uh, Alex? Yeah, I also found it really interesting and also the focus on combining skills like um, human skills and technical skills and I think to also encourage people to not just um, take their view of I'm not a technical person or I am a technical person but to enable people to see see on both sides and, and I think that's what I'm seeing a lot that um, many people that traditionally in finance wouldn't have had these technical skills now have them and that also brings me to the aspect of collaboration, which Abby was um, emphasizing that like by having all these skills and in, in situations where I then come in to also um, a consultant implement um, new solutions, that this collaboration is really helpful when people have this broad skill set. Yeah, so that uh, really resonated. Thanks. Great comments, panelists, and thank you very much, uh, uh, Abby. Let us now move on and listen to what our um, attendees have got to say about uh, team skills and uh, skill sets. So uh, what do you believe are the key skill sets required by the FPNA team in uncertain environment? If you could vote, please. Uh, the first one is techno technological skills. Second one is functional uh, as well as accounting skills. Um, third one is business acumen. And D is softer skills, if you could vote, please. So technological skills, functional and accounting, business acumen, and finally, softer skills. Uh, I've got 50% of you voted already. I'll give it another few 
Uh, second, so technological, functional and accounting, business acumen and softer skills. Um, I will now close it and I'm now going to share it. So 5% I've said technological skills, 6% functional and accounting skills, 56% are talking about business acumen and finally 33% softer skills. If I may ask uh, um, Abby and Tanbia to join me and uh, give us some insight in this, please. Uh, Abby, can I start with you? I, I think for me to see the softer skills taking the lead, and I think in this uncertain environment, that's what you need. Um, the technology skills are becoming self-service, which you can do, but it's the business skills that I think is what you need to navigate the environment. What is softer skills? You need to ensure that you know what that means for your business and how you actually interpret it to make sure you have the right soft skill that matches your business environment how you want to influence your team. The business partnering, yes, those are your Thank you. Uh, Tanbir? Yeah, it's good to see um, business acumen quite high up here as well. Um, in uncertain times, what you'll often find is that you have to make a decision, and you have to make that decision fast. Um, and for that, you need a certain amount of, well, quite a lot of commercial acumen um, and knowing um, you know, what impact it's going to have on the business. So you have to think pretty quickly. Yeah, no, uh, a great point there. I think uh, with XPNA coming in, which is integrated planning and analysis, yeah, much more emphasis is being laid on business acumen, uh, you know, know your business end to end, et cetera. And it's good to see it from here as well. So uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, both of you. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for voting as well. Uh, please keep sending your uh, questions and please try and direct them to uh, whoever you want them uh, to answer them as well. We'll try and answer as much as we can today. Those we can't, we will answer via email. So thank you very much. We will hide that and we will move now to our next presentation, which is on predictive analytics. And to tell us about it, we have got Tanvir Jessamudin, who's finance director at Vardax. And today he will tell us how to start your predictive analytics journey if you haven't already. Uh, so over to you, Tanvir. Okay, thank you, Hans. Um, so about six weeks ago, um, I had a conversation with Larissa and Hans saying, would you like to talk about predictive analytics on a webinar? Thanks, guys. Um, predictive analytics has been around for quite a long time, but the adoption, in my opinion, within the finance community, uh, community has been relatively low. Um, I think part of this is because as practitioners, we don't really know where to use it or even how it's done. Um, since I've only got seven and a half minutes left in this talk, um, I won't actually tell you how to do predictive analytics. Um, instead, what I'll try to do is give you some guidance about how you can start learning about it. Um, and I'll illustrate this with an example of using um, predictive, predictive analytics to predict um, employee attrition. Um, I'll then finish by reflecting on how we can actually improve um, adoption within FPA teams. So onto the next slide, I'll just, talk, I'll just talk a bit about the method. So I think the most important thing is to start with a business problem um, and understand the benefits that you'll get from solving that business problem. Um, a very popular use case for predictive analytics is, um, is, is trying to predict who, who, which of your employees are likely to leave. And the reason for this is that cost of attrition is really high um, in terms of lost productivity and also recruitment costs and replacement costs and so on. Um, I saw some statistics in Forbes saying that um, cost of attrition for a junior employee is around about 50% of their annual salary. Uh, for a mid-level employee, it's about 125%, and that number just keeps rising. So being able to predict this um, allows the organization to work with the risks, the, the groups of employees that are, are at risk of leaving um, and try and work with them to try and um, alleviate some of those issues. So if we wanted to build a predictive model, um, one of the main features is to really to classify employees into who's likely to leave and who's not. Uh, it's, it, this is quite a good example because it's quite a binary outcome. They're either here or they're not. A typical HR system captures all sorts of really interesting data, um, not only who, who employees are, who's still here, who's not, um, you can also capture things like the number of hours work, satisfaction levels, performance scores, how long they've been here, when they've been last promoted. Um, it's an absolute gold mine. So um, on the next slide, um, what I've done is uh, um, I've taken a large data set of about 10,000 rows of data from a website called Kaggle, which is a great source of um, sample data. 
Um, and this is this is really a, an extract from an, uh, an organisation's um, HR system. And, and what I've done on the left hand side here is it's just kind of gone through the usual kind of um, variables here. So I think I've looked at um, who's still here versus who's not. I've looked at the average performance scores. Um, in this case, they were quite similar. I've looked at things like job satisfaction scores. Um, I've looked at um, you know what's what's their um, uh, sort of uh, satisfaction with environments. Yeah, they've all got very small kind of um, kind of differences, and you can start to sort of see some trends in your mind. And um, however, you know, there's about there's about 15 or 16 different variables that we could play with here. So it's quite a large number of permutations. Um, and I think in the human mind, you can't really kind of look at more than two or three at a time. So the first thing that we did is load this, load this into Python and and uh, plotted what I call a correlation heat map. Um, in this case, the closer the correlation is to one, the more uh, you know, the stronger the relationship. Um, and so this is just the first start of trying to group people um, into um, what's likely to happen. So, so I've kind of understood the data. So on the next slide. Um, so I've kind of understood the data, I've, I've explored it. Uh, the next thing to do is um, start to build a model. Um, what we're doing is we're using historical relationships here um, and looking at the, the, the relationship between the variables and try and predict the future. Um, we're using this data um, to train the model, test the outputs um, and build a prototype. Um, we, we kind of look at the prototype, test it, see how close it is to reality. Um, and once we're happy, um, that's when we actually start to de deploy the model with live data and actually publish it and distribute it across the organization. So that in a nutshell is actually how you do start to finish um, the, the definition and build of a predictive analytics model. Um, on the next slide, please, Hans. So um, two things that you've seen in this example um, is basically there's a, bit, there's a mathematical element to it and there's a technology element to it. Um, and the third thing is, is really around the people side, which I'll cover at the end. Um, on the next slide, I'll, um, please hands. So the maths, yes, it can be complicated. Um, I've seen some people with PhD level maths doing some horrendously complex things that I've absolutely no idea how it works or what it does. Um, however, if I look at most of the algorithms that are used in predictive analytics, about two thirds of it is some form of regression or time series. Um, you know, mainly linear linear regression, a bit of logistical regression thrown in. Um, I did these at school, so the maths isn't really complicated. It has been around for a while. Um, the other thing is that you don't necessarily need to have a massive computer um, to run it. Um, I have seen it done in spreadsheets. Um, I wouldn't recommend that you do it in a spreadsheet, but it can be done. Um, if you do it on the spreadsheets, um, you're going to be limited by the number of data, the amount of data that you can use, and also it's an absolute pain in the backside to refresh. So onto the technology, onto the next slide. Um, so the technology these days gives you the ability to work with much larger volumes of data. Uh, but not only that, um, it can handle multiple, many more variables at a time. Um, I don't know about you, but I think any more than five or six variables in my head, I start to struggle a bit. Um, some people can do more. Uh, machines can do hundreds. Um, I know one retail organization that um, was predicting the stock levels throughout the week and I think they're using about 300 different demand signals as they called it. Um, the technology is actually a lot more available than you think um, and I think part of the reason for this is that um, predictive analytics drew out of a lot of data geeks online on forums uh, happy to share their science and art um, and lots of open source applications emerged so you know I use it for example Jupyter Notebooks uh, to use Python um, also as your cost very little um, the algorithms and the code, um, are, people are quite happy to share what they are, they're published online. Um, you can go onto GitHub, copy and paste, modify for your own applications and run with it. Um, yes, it is a bit um, code intensive and yes, you do need to know a bit more about it. But one of the trends that we're starting to see at the moment is that it's increasingly incorporated within the technology stacks. Um, a lot of major vendors are actually bringing it into their applications in a much more user friendly way. Um, so you've got functions straight out of the box. I can run a clustering algorithm over my customer data set um, to kind of group them, um, you know, with a click of the button rather than have to work out a k-means uh, clustering gap calculation. Um, so, okay, so the last, so the next slide, um, the last aspect of this is really around the people. Um, and reflecting back on why adoption is so low in FPNA, 
And um, I think the first thing is, is that um, with the accountant's mindset, I think we're always trying to balance things down to a penny as per historic financial reporting. Um, and getting usable data and accurate data can be tricky. Um, I think the first thing that you've got to think about is change your mindset a bit. To, you've got to be nearly right rather than precisely wrong. And um, there's quite a large corridor of uncertainty when you predict in the future. Um, and you've got to think about that um, and sort of get a directional view of travel. Um, I think the second thing is, is um, you know, referring back to um, what Abby was talking about, um, employees don't really, finance team don't really have time to learn. Um, I've worked with 30 plus finance teams and the common theme with each one of them is that they're always too busy. Um, there's always a business as usual activity going on. There's always a fire to put out um, and there's never really any learning. Um, third thing, uh, I think this is one of the most important, is that um, this concept of a black box. Um, CFOs like to look at a spreadsheet, gain confidence by looking at the formulas, they understand what it does, they can trace it back to its original source, um, and then they're happy. Um, it's a bit hard to do that when you've got lots of code and many, many rows of data and um, mathematical techniques that you're not necessarily familiar with. Um, so the way around that is a, a technique called back testing, which is you, you look at the data that you had 12 months ago, you run your model um, and see how accurate you were compared to a traditional way. I think that way you can start to prove how good your model is and start to uh, and start to gain confidence that way. Um, and I think the last and most important thing is, is really around getting people to act on the data. So again, I mentioned a retail organization um, predicting stock levels pretty accurately. Um, the problem that they had was that whilst the um, stock levels, the, the predictions were good, um, the managers always thought they knew better and never really kind of paid attention to this, to this, uh, to the uh, recommendations and always did their own thing. And of course, they got it wrong. So I'll leave you with one last slide. Um, so if you want to start learning how to do, um, do, uh, do predictive analytics, what I recommend is you go into Kaggle, which is a great website for um, all sorts of data science related challenges, um, and look at um, the Titanic data set. Um, the challenge there is from the passenger list with all sorts of demographic information like you know who they were, male, female, um, socioeconomic class, where they were in the ship at the time. Um, you've got to try and predict who survived and who didn't. Um, and, there's, and there's several tutorials on there from different people around um, how to do this. So it's a really good way of kind of working through um, a well-known data set um, and seeing how you can actually do uh, and predict the outcome. Tanvir, thank you very much. A great presentation. I think uh, you know you've uh, you've showed us how you start from the very beginning um, and uh, uh, where do you go? What are the key issues, etc. Um, so thank you for that. I'd like to ask the other uh, panelists to come and join us and give us some comment. Uh, Tanvir, we've lost your uh, um, webcam as well, by the way. So um, now, if I can start uh, with yourself. Sure. Uh, thanks, Tambir. Very insightful uh, presentation. Uh, I can very much relate to uh, the steps you presented uh, to get started uh, with uh, predictive analytics. And I like the fact that uh, you called out as well the, the main roadblocks. I, I, the concept of black box in particular um, resonates uh, a lot with me. Um, I think it's all about creating trust. Uh, without trust, the risk is to create what we called at some point uh, shadow finance processes so basically people that were back to old habits in the background uh, working uh, in offline spreadsheets and in the end not leveraging the great analytics that uh, that you're providing them so uh, in my view it's important to move um, step by step uh, to explain how you do those predictive analytics and uh, ultimately to uh, to drive adoption Thank you. Um, Abby, can I come to you, please? Yeah, it's a very nice presentation in terms of learning how to start up that journey um, and, and telling us where to go. Um, but from a people perspective, is if you're employing people to do the job as managers, trust them to do the job. Um, most of us get in the best where we still want to do what we've always done. Um, you talked about Excel spreadsheets. Um, I'm sure there will be lots of questions for you on how to get from what we are used to, to self-service, to actually enhancing and letting technology do the job for us. Uh, and I think that's where we can make a lot of difference, both with people, the process, uh, and the platforms that we use, if we just let them do the job. Thank you. And finally, Alex. 
Yeah, fantastic presentation and also I think really helpful to demystifying like um, maybe still buzzwords like predictive analytics and, and showing us specific use cases and which potential journey can be taken to, to start this journey. And um, I think yeah, many of these examples also show that um, going forward um, advances in technology then can also help to, to um, get you to adopt this because as Tanbi pointed out, um, the basics have been around for quite some time. Yeah, no, absolutely great point from you, Alex, there in that, yes, there's lots of tool out there that already are implementing this uh, going forward. So not a lot of uh, uh, hard work is required uh, upfront. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation and, and the co excellent comments as well there, uh, panelists. Let us now hear from our uh, members in terms of what are they doing in that sort of space. So if I launch my uh, third polling question, do you actually, do you use predictive prescriptive analytics to facilitate decision making process within your organization? If you can vote, please. So option one is yes, it provides efficiency advantages and new insight, absolutely. B we will be implementing in the short term, so we're not currently doing it. C, it is part of a longer term strategy, so there's quite a bit of time there to go. And finally, D, no, we don't have any plans to implement any predictive planning, predictive analytics. Uh, if you can vote, please. So A, yes, we do, and it gives us great advantages and insight. B, we will be implementing in the short term. C, it is part of a longer term strategy. And finally, D, no, we don't have any plans to implement uh, at all. Uh, we've got 70% voted already. I'm going to now close uh, and I'm going to share the results. So 12% um, say yes, we do. And it provides efficiencies and helps us with new insight. 22% short term strategy, 41% longer term strategy, 26%, no, we don't have any plans to implement. Uh, members of the panel, I'd like to invite all of you to come and join us and give us some comments on this. Uh, as we uh, started with um, Tanvir, Tanvir, can I start with you? Yeah, it's quite good to see um, that 63% are thinking about putting it in. Um, my advice for you guys is, um, don't just think about one or two isolated operational use case. Think about how you're going to join several models up together as part of a wider um, forecasting value chain. Thank you. Uh, Alex? Yeah, um, also quite interesting to see that there's like a big split across the groups, but um, I think it's it's good that most people um, yeah, have already got this on their strategic plan. And it's also exciting to see that there's uh, lots of improvement ahead in the future. Yeah. Thank you. And now, can I ask you for your comment as well, please? Yeah, on my side, I have to say I'm a bit uh, surprised by uh, by the large portion, 26 percent, um, not uh, not using it uh, yet, and I'm sure uh, this will evolve evolve fast because of the the technology that is more and more uh, accessible, but also uh, as we discussed earlier, because of uh, all the change that uh, that makes it more and more complicated, basically to uh, to just rely on uh, on our traditional. Uh, processes. So I'm um, looking forward to see uh, those uh, statistics uh, in a year or two from now. Thank you. And finally, Abby? Hi, I think for those other 26 percent, I'm going to say, has COVID taught you to look at your processes and adapt? And if COVID was to happen again, how prepared are you in making sure those predictions? So go back today, and that's why you're here on this call, to actually think what is stopping you from at least thinking of or at least having a plan because sometimes all you need is to start that plan and you see that there's a lot more there is a price pocket for everybody in predictive analytics find one and start your journey that's what i advise absolutely spot on there uh, great answers and, and of course you know with um technology bringing it as part of the platform as well this should help uh and we've seen that uh, yeah, over the last year very definitely you know, we need these kind of insight from our data. And as data gets better and stronger, yeah, we're going to see a lot more of that. Uh, panelists, thank you very much for your comments. Let me now hide this and let us move on uh, with our uh, next piece. Uh, thank you very much for voting as well, members. Uh, please keep sending your 
questions as well. We've got lots of questions. We will try and answer uh, a few of them today and the rest will be answered via email. So moving on now uh, to our next session, which is on technology. And to deliver that, we've got Alexander uh, Hermes, Alex, uh, Principal Consultant at CCH to get to. So over to you, Alex. Thank you, Hans. So um, I will now be speaking about the role of technology um, in regards to scenario planning and predictive planning. And if we move to the first slide, I think before we look at um, scenario planning and predictive analytics, I think it is important to make sure that we get the basics right. So um, I think when we speak about technology in this context, um, I see something like a finance platform which is a um, product, a technology, which can provide um, all these things. And in order to be able to do a scenario planning predictive analytics within this finance platform, I see four key components which have to be in place first. So one of these components um, is data management. So in order to perform all the scenario planning, all the predictive analytics, a lot of data is required and to have technology in place which allows you to collate and integrate all this data is a very crucial part. So here I think also referring to, to Abby's um, um, presentation, it's really important that technology enables also business users to, to handle such processes and get the information into such solutions. Um, by, by doing so, um, this brings me to the next point of accessibility. So if data can be handled and managed easily, it then also becomes accessible. Again, um, technology then can help with um, advanced reporting, self-service BI to, to, to make this data even more accessible and again, um, reducing the required technical skills from the people that, that consume this data. So um, then also we have seen in um, the presentation of uh, Nawel that um, it's then really important to also start your journey with um, looking at um, individual um, planning processes and to then have also a technology which helps you guide these processes. And um, here I'm looking at integration of operational plans. So to perform all these plans within one platform and to be able to integrate these with each other. So technology can help you to facilitate this and um, these operational plans then can be consolidated into one strategic plan and, and then um, drivers can be updated. And that's like something really important before we go into, into the scenario planning point. And of course, if we've got all these things in place, we are speaking of a single point of truth. So you do not have to spend any time. Technology enables you to have this all at your fingertip and you've got your actual data, your, your plan data all alongside each other and it is um, easily available. So these are the pillars to looking at scenario planning and um, predictive analytics from a technological point of view. Um, so I would like to um, share an example with you um, on the basis of scenario planning of a project that I implemented for a big manufacturing company. And this manufacturing company performed a measure and scenario planning approach. So if we look in the box on the left, um, they had sales planning, personnel planning, production planning, capex planning, and this all fed into a strategic financial plan. Um, technology here helped to, um, for example, perform the sales plan on a very, very detailed level. And um, technology helped here to import um, source data from a different system. So here um, from CRM system, uh, order backlog was imported for uh, individual orders of machines. And then these orders um, represented um, so-called um, measures and additional measures could be planned in the sales planning. For example, a, a revenue campaign, which would have some, some uh, marketing cost spot, like some expected uh, revenue increases. And these measures could then be switched on and off and fed into the financial plan. So these are the toggle switches that represent that certain measures can be selected or deselected. The same approach was also applied in the other um, modules. And for that reason, already this measure approach with toggling um, specific measures already provides some form of, of scenario planning. 
and then um, the solution and many other technical um, technologies have like the possibility to create um, snapshots so that's this representation on the right so we can make assumptions and um, these these solutions these operational plans can be driver based and then we run a scenario um, that can be our best case scenario we, we run some alternative scenarios and also have a worst case scenario and we can easily compare these scenarios to each other and in times like COVID, for example, um, this approach and having the technology at the fingertip and, for example, here being able to go back to the detail of the measures and switching these on and off, putting new assumptions into it, um, um, enables to be able to react to a situation really fast. Yeah, so this is how um, we see how technology really supports this process of scenario planning. Then moving on to the next slide, I um, want to look at how machine learning can be applied within such a finance platform and how it can, um, from a technical log technological point, um, help you um, create such plans. So um, Tan Beer um, has touched in his um, presentation on the fact that this um, technology has been around for a long time, but that there are some topics such as not having time to use it and, um, for example, also skills and, and the, the um, point of it being a black box, not understanding um, what it does, are uh, um, limitations for adopting it. So many platforms now um, provide this technology in build, like for example ours as well. And um, here, when we look at this, um, um, this diagram, we now see a finance platform, and I want to focus on the left part of this. So within the finance platform with the data integration, we have already got our actual data available because it's um, been imported, it's been used for the scenario planning and um, basic planning. And now machine learning models are available, which um, can be used by the business user, just with a user interface. And these models can be run over the actual data. And the idea here is that such a model tries to recreate the past, so to identify why did it happen. And the concept of machine learning is you rerun such a model. And if the model manages to recreate the actuals, then it's working well. But if it doesn't do that yet, you can add extra variables. So, for example, if you're trying to forecast revenues and the model is not yet being, um, is not capable of recreating this, you could add a variable of customer satisfaction and then um, rerun this model. And once you get a match, then you have identified. Um, a big number of variables which are influencing the revenues and um, this then gives you confidence in the model because you understand what are the variables and why is it coming to these conclusions how can it recreate the past and not only do such models help you to identify the drivers but they also help you to um, understand even a further link so for example how long in advance do the customer satisfaction numbers have to go up for this to lead to positive revenues. So once you've then gathered this insight and you've trained this model within the platform and with the technology, you now can apply it to your planning data and start using this model to look at what will happen. So now after you've got the insights and the confidence in this model, you can run it over your planning data um, using these variables to then get a prediction. And um, from here, again, also taking some insights, which uh, now has pointed out, uh, incremental um, aspect can or uh, approach can be selected. So if you've got a driver-based um, planning ap approach, you can either feed in these, uh, these results immediately to bring to um, like a, a result, or you can just take these insights and consider them in your planning approach. But I think the main takeaway here is um, technology now provides you all the basics that you need. You can um, integrate your data, you can make this data available, you can perform scenario planning, and now you can also easily adopt machine learning models and then start to just bring this all together and um, make sure that technology isn't being used for the sake of technology, but in order to help you um, gain your insights and, and have uh, um, very easy accessibility. Thank you. Alex, great presentation. Love the uh, uh, how you started with the four um, pillars of you know what you need to get right to start the whole um, process by, and then the uh, uh, the couple of examples you 
took us through as well. And finally, you know, how to apply um, AI and machine learning to the planning tool and how to train the model. And finally, how that model gives you the desired in input. So uh, excellent. Thank you very much for that. Uh, guys, we've got lots of questions coming in, so please keep sending them on. Really good one. And uh, we will shortly be going to our Q&A session. But before that, let me ask our panelists to join us and give us some insights uh, into Alex's presentation and how they see technology faring as well. So if I may start with you now. Sure. Thanks a lot, Alex. I think great presentation. I, I very much enjoyed it. Um, as uh, Hans was saying, I, I very much uh, liked uh, how you showed us how uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning uh, can help us, but at the same time, how you stressed uh, the importance of, uh, of having the basics right. Uh, to that extent, in my view, we, we also need to, uh, to start thinking um, how we will transform our uh, wider processes uh, around uh, all these new uh, forecasting capabilities and predictive capabilities. Um, FPNA, for instance, in my view, has traditionally built very strong calendars uh, and with integrated predictive analytics with scenario planning, we will need to rethink th those calendars. When and how uh, does it make sense to use uh, all these new insights? I think that's the, that's the next step. Thank you, Nell. Uh, Abby, can I come to you, please? Hi. Uh, very lovely presentation, Alex. It kind of demystifies how technology can actually work for you and changing it. So if the foundation is right, there's a saying that what could the builders do? So if you don't get that foundation right, no matter what you build, you're actually building a house that will crumble irrespective of how you do it. So and extending technology to provide the basis that adds value we do these things in FPNA and all the transformation, all the technology we do at the back of the mind is to make sure that we can help support the business. And that's what it's all about. So it's not doing it, like you said, for the sake of technology, it's actually doing it for a reason, for a vision, and actually making sure that that vision is encapsulated in the, in the technology that we, we, we do. Why are we doing predictive analytics? Why do we do we just do it just because it's a fancy tool out there or it's a buzzword? We do it to support the business to add value and bring in the technology to extend our human capability and our best access. But without technology and without people, you, you are only as, as good as what you know. So very good insight. Thank you. And finally, Tambir. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that presentation, Alex. It was really good. Um, really good to see what technology can do. I'm just going to build on what Abby was saying about that foundation. Um, I think there's two things that you absolutely must have to get right. One is the information strategy and one is the data strategy. So the information strategy is about understanding what is driving value in your organization and therefore what decisions you need to make in order to drive those, um, to drive that value. Um, and once you understood that, then you understand what data you need to support those decisions, what information needs to look like. And the second thing is around about the data strategy, which is really, you know, where does that data exist? If you don't have it now, how are you going to source it? Where is it going to be stored? How are you going to, and more importantly, how are you going to keep it clean? And what are the sort of data standards you're going to put in place? Um, and I think those are the fundamental things if you're going to get the technology to work for you. Um, I always describe it as, um, you know, you have to do it in that order because I always describe it as if you want to put your head out the window, you open the window first, then put your head through. If you try to do it the other way around and put the technology in first, it's quite painful. It hurts, believe me. Thank you very much, Tandia. Uh, panelists, thank you very much for uh, all the very insightful comments and Alex, great presentation. Let us now go on and listen to uh, what our um, FPNA board members and uh, attendees uh, are doing as far as tool is concerned. So I've just uh, uh, launched our last polling question. So how would you describe your scenario planning tool uh, and model? Uh, Non-existent, so there's no tool for it. Um, it is Excel, not driver-based uh, model. Excel, but driver-based. Dedicated planning system, but we don't use driver-based. And finally, dedicated planning system, driver-based uh, modeling as well. If you can vote, please. So first of all, A, non-existent. Uh, B, Excel, but not driver-based. C, Excel, driver-based. D, dedicated planning system that is not driver-based. And finally, 
uh, dedicated planning system, uh, which is driver-based uh, and multi-dimensional as well, I would guess. So um, we have got 60% uh, voted. I'll give it another five seconds. Um, and I'm now going to close the vote. Uh, and I'm going to share it. So 2% have said non-existent at all, so they don't have any sort of tool, um, neither Excel, nothing. 27% Excel, not driver base. 44% Excel, uh, driver base. 12% dedicated planning system, which is not driver base. And finally, 15% dedicated planning system and driver base model. Thank you for voting. Can I ask uh, the panelists to come and join me uh, and give us some insight? And I will start with Alex. Alex? Yeah, um, I think this um, looks really interesting and also would like to pick up a point that Tambia made um, before you kind of pick the technology, make sure that you um, have worked out um, what you want to do. And here being Excel driver-based model being the biggest position actually shows that um, the, the model and the ideas seem to be in place and that maybe the next step could be the adoption of technology to, to enhance this process. Thank you very much. Uh, Nawal, can I come to you? Yes, yeah, similar ob observation from my side. I think it's important to, um, to test basically uh, in Excel and to, uh, to define, to identify those drivers uh, before moving to, uh, to something more scalable and, uh, and investing um, in, uh, in strong development. So uh, that seems um, very wise as a distribution. Thank you, uh, Abby. So is Excel dead is what I am thinking about. I know there's a lot of talk about not using Excel and moving into um, more um, technology driven basis. So it's really surprising to see that Excel is still a tool that can be used and it's a right step. And like Neil said, this is the beginning. Uh, I would say don't stop there because it's a journey. Um, there are benefits and, and and learnings, lessons learned from early adopters in terms of what to do. So Excel is a great place to start, but don't stop in your comfort zone um, because after a while it becomes obsolete. So yes, it's in the right direction. Yes, you're looking at your data model. Yes, um, Excel gives you your comfort and your and your ability to look at things. But I will encourage the 70% that we're almost looking at roughly to move to the next level and try that next step in terms of toying with the technology and bringing in the right people to help you extend that technology as well. But it's, it's good to see that Excel still ranks as a tool. Thank you. Finally, Tanvir? Yeah, so 71% of our respondents are using Excel, um, which I think I mean, considering how long the technology has been around for, it's just I'm just really curious. Um, I think we all know the challenges of Excel. You know, there's limited functionality, limited amount of data you can process. There's no audit trail. There's no workflow or anything like that that you get in a modern system. Um, and it's also a pain in the ass to refresh every time. So um, I'm just wondering, you know, is part of this reason because we've not really been educated in how to use dedicated planning systems, or is it because um, there's been so many failed implementations in the past of dedicated planning systems, so people prefer to stick to what they know in Excel? Absolutely spot on uh, there, Tanbia. I mean, that's one of the things I would wanted to highlight as well. 71%, um, that, that's just amazing. And, and of course, there's also this uh, notion of cost as well, uh, that it, it costs a few million to implement. So that's another aspect that people need to um, really look at. Yeah. Exactly. No, that, that, that's exactly my point, Tanbia. It doesn't anymore. The people have got it in their mindset that it does. So. Uh, that's another point that they need to kind of think about um, because with all the inefficiencies and, um, and now I'll mention very well at the beginning is that only 15% of time is being in value add. And if you don't have a tool, you know, that that is like, you know, 90% of your time is pushing Excel around. So um, I, I would agree with all of your comments there. Thank you very much, uh, uh, panelists. And thank you very much, members, to um, for your votes today, all of it. And please keep sending your questions. So we've got lots of exciting questions coming shortly, um, and we will answer uh, a few of them. Those that we can't, we will go on to answer um, uh, via email. So thank you very much for that.
Um, it is now a, a, a great time to do some conclusions. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you can join me on the webcam um, and we will go around uh, and get some key conclusions, key takeaways from our panelists today. So uh, now, what will be your key conclusion from this session today? So from my side and resonating a bit with, uh, with the experience we had in, um, at Medtronic, I want to stress the importance of being patient uh, in, the, in this journey. Um, it's important to appreciate that it's not fast and not an easy journey. Uh, when we talk about technology, generally we like to see uh, things uh, going at uh, super speed. Uh, but as Alex highlighted, it's important to, um, to have the, the basics right. Uh, like every change, it's, it's difficult actually before it becomes uh, easier and, um, and simpler. So it's important to, uh, to be humble, uh, to take uh, an agile approach, to test, to fail, to learn, uh, to adjust. Um, but when you get started, that's, uh, that's so exciting. So um, yeah, I think it's about patience and about trust. Thank you, Nell. Um, Abby, your key conclusion? Uh, I think my key conclusion is find time to learn. Technology is changing faster than you think. So take the time out to you as managers to improve yourself. And also we'll also find that time actively, selfishly create time to learn. Um, technology in itself is not going to solve all our problems. We are the human extenders of what technology can achieve. So the more you learn, the more you are willing to actually extend. Um, chicken out laws think about change. If you do not like change, trust me, you will not like what obsolete looks like. So be active, be, take your time to actually learn what is out there. FPA was not taught in school when I was in school. So and data analyst wasn't there in 10 years, 10 years ago, but we are adapting and growing. Have a growth mindset. Be willing and be able to change what you know. And that's where we creep away from Excel and use something else because you were not taught Excel in school, but you learned it. So, hey, learn again. Thank you, Abby. Tanbir, your key conclusion? Yeah, so um, similar to what Abby was saying, I think you've got to invest a bit of time um, in your learning and in your development. Otherwise, you're going to be continually fighting that latest fire. Um, you know, by investing in that time, you, by investing that time up front, you make your life easier further down the line. And so, yeah, just you know, make that time, be bold, take a risk, experiment, fail fast, and learn from it, and keep pushing forward. Otherwise, you're not moving at all. Thank you, Dan Beer. And finally, Alex. Yeah, um, I hope, uh, and I think that the four um, presentations have shown that this topic can be seen or must be seen from from different angles, and to make sure that all the, um, these aspects are accommodated to, to come to a good conclusion and to, to make sure that your journey to, to adopting this and having scenario planning, predictive planning in place um, is successful. Thank you, everyone. I think we've seen from Nawal's presentation in terms of you know where he started his journey with driver-based planning and then going on to scenario planning uh, to the point of now introducing AI and ML and predictive planning. And then we've heard from Abby today about how important it is, you know, to keep your team motivated, especially in times of uncertainty, keep upskilling and keep moving them on, uh, but also making sure that they are OK and they're doing well, uh, especially working from home, uh, et cetera. And then finally, we, um, we heard from Tanbir about how to start that predictive analytics journey from very, very humble beginnings uh, and then look at platforms. And then Alex has shared with us today as to you know, the four key pillars and then how you put AI and ML um, into practice as well. So great insight. Thank you very much, uh, uh, everyone. It is now a great time to start the Q&A session. So I've got lots of questions, but unfortunately we can't attend to all of them. So we'll try and uh, uh, answer a few today and the rest we will answer via email. So the first question is uh, to now. Now, we talked about, you know, driver-based planning uh, in your presentation. Um, and the question is, how do you determine what are your drivers? So if you can give us an example 
uh, at the baseline, especially in uncertain environment? So there are different steps that uh, that we've been taking. I think the uh, the step by step learning was important by. Uh, uh, working the business acumen by uh, interviewing a business to understand really how they were uh, driving the business. Traditionally, uh, for revenues, for instance, we were just looking at units and um, average selling prices. That's where uh, our all the models were built. And um, uh, all of a sudden, trying to go beyond this, we were more trying to understand how are you actually selling a product? Is it because of an install based uh, where uh, you will uh, you will sell um, um, uh, products related to that? Or are you going to bundle it with another product? Um, it was much more about basically interviewing the business, understanding really how the, the, the sale was performed and translating basically uh, the forecasting process in something more meaningful um, for um, uh, for the commercial teams rather than uh, for financial ones. At least that's what we've done on uh, on the revenue side. Now, for a certain moment, uh, it was uh, about taking a bit of distance as well and understanding uh, what were the the major. Uh, impacts um, and as i mentioned earlier when it comes to the to the medical device industry it has been a lot about uh, hospital capacity the fact that uh, a lot of hospitals had to um, to free up space for covid patients um, was the, the biggest impact we had. It was not about our own products. The, the, the products were good, still uh, um, uh, well accepted by, uh, by, pinch, by patients and, uh, and by uh, healthcare professionals. But just to access the hospital became uh, a problem. So it's a kind of combination of the two, understanding your, uh, your business very well, but also taking a bit of distance and understanding uh, external factors as well. Uh, thank you, Nawal. And, and also, I'd like to add that, of course, this is where machine learning comes into play as well in terms of looking at your data and finding out those drivers that, you know, that I can't see or the human mind can't see as well. So uh, this is where you've got uh, human uh, drivers as well as AI determined uh, drivers as well. So uh, a great answer there. Thank you very much, Nawal. Um, our second question goes to Abby. Abby, you've spoken a lot about the skill set, et cetera, um, you know, throughout your presentation and the comments. Uh, can you just tell us a few examples of what you've done uh, with your team, especially, you know, taking them away um, and finding that headspace to be able to look at processes and improvement and things like that? Everybody's so busy is what we're saying, you know, where do you find it or where and how do you find the time to step back? Um, I, I think it, it comes straight first from the manager's idea. I'm a big promoter of learning. I'm a big promoter of finding that time. So simple things I've taught them or I've suggested is when you're driving down to the office, there are podcasts. Um, find one, you know, learn it. And then during our one-to-one -one or our team meetings, um, giving them five minutes to spotlight themselves and just say that. Um, another thing is we had different technology because over time we had different legacy systems that we've improved upon was to actively identify within my team subject matter experts for those um, technology uh, and make sure that they own it and they can train the team in terms of going far together. Um, and one thing I tend to do is it's most of these podcasts are four minutes. Uh, there's an interesting one where how do you start a movement? The movement never starts with the leader. It starts with the first follower. So I identify my first follower and then send them out because they are your business partners. You can have all the visions you want as a manager and as a leader, but you're not there. You're not everywhere. You are not an octopus. You don't have all the hands. So you need your first leaders and it's identifying that and trying to make yourself obsolete. So make your team own it. So sometimes I sit back, I like to talk. So I sit back and let my team talk at meetings um, and, and let them be there so that they can build the confidence, see the reason why they do things, understanding why they do things. Because sometimes it's not just in finishing the task, it's saying how visible that task is. Uh, I'm telling my, my new direct report to say, 
your job. This is how the CFO, CFO presented it. It is your numbers that the CFO is talking about. It's joining that link, but it starts with you as a manager creating that space. So in today's technology and in Microsoft, it will tell you learning time, it will tell you break time. Adopt those things. You might not use everything, but try, start and be selfish about it it's it's your development i can't take you to the waters but i can't force you to drink it so within your training and development so even for my team when we do our goals we actually put in a goal to study not just your qualification or professional qualification but something else because sometimes i get people that started off as accountants and wants to do systems and they had they didn't know because they didn't never try it and when they started it they loved it and wanted to do something else so expose them and and, and, and and actively dedicate time so some of my team meetings is time to listen to videos it's time to share each other's knowledge and sometimes i say today is not a day of mourning let us celebrate our little wins what have you done display it let us see the first time i started that the whole room was quiet. Nobody could say anything they have achieved. But as we got into that habit, we all started getting excited and somebody was looking forward to coming and say, we all have problems. We all moan about what we can do and how busy we are. Sometimes just step back and say, what have I achieved today? And say. Excellent tips, uh, uh, Abby. Thank you very much. Uh, just before we come to you, Tanvi, I'd just like to remind the attendees that uh, Keep posting your questions. We will answer them um, via email, definitely those we can't get to. So please keep doing it until uh, we end the session. Uh, Tanvi, a very interesting question for you, uh, of course, on predictive analytics. What is an acceptable corridor of uncertainty in predictive analytics? How do you manage this margin, especially when doing financial planning? Okay. Um, uh, that, that... It's a really evil question. Um, I'm going to turn this around a bit by saying, um, what is your decision tolerance? You know, at what point, um, how big, how big an error do you need to make before a decision becomes wrong? Um, and I think this really then becomes, um, this really varies by industry to industry. So if you're in retail, for example, um, where you're working on kind of, you know, percentage, mar you know, like half a percent margin or something like that, you have to be very accurate. Whereas if you're working in professional services with a 50% margin, I think your corridor of your um, margin for error can be a lot higher. Absolutely. So I think I've probably avoided that question slightly, but um, that's the <laughs> uh, Thank you very much uh, for that, Tanbia. And uh, uh, our final question goes to Alex. Uh, Alex, uh, how do you apply predictive learning or, or AI in a decentralized global environment? Is, is it somewhat different to a, a globalized uh, environment? Um, well, I think um, especially like from, from my experience with um, such finance platform with operational plans, they can be decentralized so that um, operational plans just um, cater for a specific region. But again, technology here doesn't really mind if, if it's um, global or, or not. So um, the technology would easily allow you to um, take um, the data that you have and also just um, run it on a um, small scale for, for a region. So um, I think that would also be a really good opportunity to, to apply this incremental step. So maybe to just have a pilot region with a very specific case to apply this technology with the available data and then to take these findings to then um, maybe have that like as a as a blueprint for a global rollout so yeah no sorry carry on no i think that that was the main main sentiment yeah yeah no absolutely i was just going to add to that is is exactly as you would do it in a centralized uh, scenario you can do it in a decentralized scenario and uh, a great point there alex in terms of trying to run it as a pilot as well so uh, thank you very much uh, uh, members of the panel uh, for answering those questions we've got lots more we will get to all of them uh, via email and we will answer them so please keep sending them I've got just a few more slides to go. So if you'd like to just keep your webcam on and uh, we'll just run through your, the last few slides. So ladies and gentlemen, we've got uh, a couple of webinars for your diary there. 
the FBNA Trends webinar on latest trends and development in the financial planning and analysis, which is our survey running for the fourth year. Very, very insightful. So please join us on the 6th of July, 2021. Uh, you can click on the link there to take you directly for registration. And the final one there is the Digital London FBNA Circle on FBNA integration on September 23rd. So please join us for uh, both of them. Uh, it's a good time to say thank you to our sponsors today, uh, uh, Walter Kluis, uh, CCH Targeted Company, um, and to say a big thank you to our member of the panel um, for different uh, panel for different presentation, great insight, uh, as well as great insight uh, from the polling question. And finally, a big thank you to all of our attendees today for making the time. Uh, hoping that the session has been as fruitful uh, for you guys. Uh, this is how we can keep in touch, so please do so. Uh, it is almost time for me to close the call. Just a quick reminder that at the end, of, when I close it, there's a feedback session, so please stay and give us some feedback. Let us know what else you want to hear about in the next session. So for now, thank you very much from us. Uh, until next time, goodbye and have a great evening. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.